Gut, ich wiederhole jetzt trotzdem nicht, was ich gesagt habe. Ich sagte schon, es ist nicht so einfach, nach einem erschütternden und auch traurig machenden Film zu moderieren. Ich muss auch sagen, dass wir als Veranstalterin Gunnar-Werner-Institut in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung natürlich auch nicht so froh sind darüber, dass dieses so wichtige Thema nicht mehr Gäste ins Haus gebracht hat. Das ist schon auch... Wir wissen es nicht, warum. Ich kann Ihnen versichern, dass wir sehr, sehr viele Verteiler bedient haben, von Afrika bis Entwicklung bis äh, Frauennetzwerke. Umso mehr freuen wir uns über jeden und jede, die hier ist. Sie sind uns ein, heute Abend eben ein ganz kostbarer Gast. Und äh, ich denke, dass wir in diesem Gespräch, was wir miteinander führen, einige Aspekte des Films vertiefen können. Ich möchte jetzt gar nicht groß ähm, noch einführen, weil der Film ja im Prinzip die Themen, die wir heute Abend besprechen wollen, ganz gut berührt. Was sind eigentlich die Gründe, was sind die Ursachen dafür, dass so viele Kinder als Soldaten und Soldatinnen rekrutiert werden? Was passiert mit ihnen, wenn sie aussteigen oder fliehen? Das werden wir mit den Gästen hier weiter äh, vertiefen und besprechen können. Wir möchten im zweiten Teil, möchte ich vor allem das Thema aufgreifen, was kann eigentlich die internationale Community tun. Sie hat Mitverantwortung unter anderem über Waffenlieferungen. Sie hat auch eine koloniale Vergangenheit, äh, vor allem mit Uganda. Das ist das eine, was wir hier ansprechen werden. Und dann ist es so, dass mittlerweile ja auch das internationale Völkerrecht ähm, einiges zu bieten hat, wenn es darum ginge, Täter, Straftäter, Täter ähm, zu verfolgen. Äh, was passiert da eigentlich? Was nützt uns das Völkerrecht? Wie wird es umgesetzt? Warum wird es nicht äh, umgesetzt? Das möchten wir heute Abend versuchen, hier mit den Gästen zu besprechen. Ich werde immer nacheinander die Gäste vorstellen, die hier auf dem Podium mit mir sitzen. Jetzt nicht von vornherein, sondern jedes Mal, wenn ich die Frage dann direkt adressiere. Und hier ist mir jetzt ein besonderes Vergnügen. Und wir hatten Sie heute schon da bei einem Fachgespräch heute Nachmittag, äh, Grace Arad. Grace ist die Sozialarbeiterin, 23 Jahre vor sieben Jahren, als der Film gedreht wurde, die Sie im Film gesehen haben. Sie hat als Sozialarbeiterin mit den Kindern gearbeitet. Ganz, ganz herzlich willkommen, auch noch mal in diesem Rahmen, Grace. Grace, ich sagte es schon, hat als Sozialarbeiterin, und sie wird es auch in Zukunft tun, aus anderer Perspektive, mit den Kindern und Jugendlichen gearbeitet, wie Sie es im Film gesehen haben. Sie kommt jetzt und heute frisch aus Australien, wo sie in den, ihren Master for International Development an der Universität South Wales gemacht hat. Ich möchte Grace am Anfang fragen, jetzt viele Jahre nach dem Film, Du hast selbst im Film gesagt, ich werde wahnsinnig oder ich habe Angst, wahnsinnig zu werden, wenn ich mich im Alltag mit den Sorgen, Problemen, Traumatisierungen der Kinder auseinandersetzen muss. Zwei Fragen. Wie geht es dir heute, Jahre danach? Wie gehst du mit diesem täglichen Umgang heute für dich um? Hast du Abstand gefunden? Und das Zweite Vielleicht kannst du das verknüpfen miteinander. Hat eigentlich Lost Children, der Film, was bewirkt in der Perzeption des Problems, des Umgangs mit Kindersoldatinnen und Soldaten? Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm glad that this is the second time I'm visiting Germany. The first time I came in 2006 when this documentary was launched. But now if you look at me, you compare with the 2006 when the documentary was made. I was 
the most traumatized person, even more than the client themselves. But then someone may ask, why did you insist to work even if you are traumatized? I think that, will, that, 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 has, that was the best place for me because if I tried to leave that place, I would feel more haunted than uh, anything. Uh, today, someone may be questioning why, why uh, above all other films or documentary, we have to repeat this uh, lost children documentary. I think it should just be a reflection to help us deal with other ongoing conflicts, especially against uh, children. And uh, secondly, it should help us develop uh, interventions. When you see the film, if there were mistakes that were made, I think in the coming intervention, such mistake uh, should no longer be there because uh, this film portrays the try and error during war and uh, we try to our level best to integrate these children. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the children, the four children in the documentary. Akelo Jennifer is currently, of course, married. She has four children, and she's still with the, the husband. And the, the documentary wasn't finished, because there's also other part that she was, how they got into relationship with the partner. Then uh, Uchaya is still continuing with his uh, formal education. He's now in senior, he sat his senior four. Uh, this last year, and I think it's now going to senior five. And uh, Upio, as it's mentioned in the documentary, after now no one knows where he is, which is uh, very sad, of course. Then uh, Kilama. Kilama has been a child that I really struggle. Even after we reunited him, I really struggled and he was my son. I tried in all ways to make him live like any child in the community, but um, unfortunately, God did not allow. And all my success in working with uh, returning mother, uh, returning ret the children of war or child soldiers, when I begin to think and reflect my effort and my endeavor, I look at Kilama as one of my biggest achievements with war victims. But unfortunately, Kilama passed away. He died, if you had in the documentary, he had some kind of uh, disease that he came with from the bush. And I think it's more associated with the kind of food he was eating, the kind of life he was exposed in. He developed problem with uh, the lung. And uh, he just had to stay like three days and he passed away. But before he died, he had done a lot of things in his life and he was a very successful boy. He had opened even a farm, a uh, piggery project, and had a very big garden for sugar cane, about five acres, but he did not live to see. So. Uh, that is it. May his soul rest in peace. Uh, the Lost Children documentary has done a lot 
has changed a lot. You know, this war in northern Uganda was not something that uh, uh, was hard even in 2006 when it was uh, uh, shown in, in Germany. But uh, after the documentary was shown, when we went back, so many things changed. I think that was also the period when the war in northern Uganda, at least after one year, uh, subsided. And uh, a lot of projects to support the integration of these children came up. And uh, the, 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 the fundraising also under Caritas uh, International did not only help the children in that were under Caritas program, but also around the world, it also helped other children from other countries who are still, who are still in that problem of, uh, of war. So the, the documentary, uh, I would say, it has been the most successful one. But uh, when, we are, when we are reflecting it, we shouldn't reflect it as if something is still going on. There's no longer war in northern Uganda. Um, the only war that we are left with is the war for rebuilding the, the region, more especially. The the uh, reintegration of these returnees has been successful, I would say. But then, considering the poverty level in the region, not all can be done in just a day. All this is going to be a process, but still takes us back in the kind of leadership that we have and the policy that we have to such vulnerable people so that they really come out of uh, their problems. So I think for now, I, I can stop here. If there is any question, you can channel to me and I try to respond to. I'm sure that there will be many questions. Um, well. Ich möchte vor allem an Grace, aber jetzt zunächst an Theo Hollander, den ich gleich vorstelle, noch mal die Frage richten, etwas mehr, der Film hat es getan, aber noch mal zu schildern, was es so schwer macht und was die Barrieren sind, Kinder mit diesen Erfahrungen, mit diesen Gewalterfahrungen, mit Erfahrung sexueller Gewalt, mit selber Täter sein und geschossen und getötet zu haben, was die Probleme und Schwierigkeiten sind, sie, sie ins Leben zurückzuholen, wenn es überhaupt so etwas wie Normalität geben kann unter solchen Erfahrungen und nach solchen Erfahrungen. Ich möchte das Theo Hollander fra äh, fragen, einfach deshalb, weil er Uganda sehr gut kennt, aber auch andere Konfliktregionen. Theo Landa arbeitet für das Center for Conflict Studies in Utrecht, aber mehr noch äh, mit einer Organisation, die in Uganda arbeitet, nämlich dem Refugee Law äh, Projects äh, in Uganda. Er schreibt derzeit äh, seine Doktorarbeit äh, mit dem Schwerpunkt äh, zu den Auswirkungen des Konflikts im Ostkongo und zwar eben genau auf das, was uns ja auch hier und heute interessiert auf die Geschlechterverhältnisse und auf die Geschlechterkonstruktionen. Wie verändern sich Geschlechterverhältnisse, wie verändern sich Geschlechterkonstruktionen im Laufe des Konflikts, im Laufe eines Krieges, auch im Laufe von Aufarbeitung oder Conflict Resolution. Aber hier nochmal jetzt meine Frage an Sie und dann gerne auch natürlich ergänzt durch Grace. Was ist es, was es so schwer macht, überhaupt zu integrieren? Was sind Voraussetzungen dafür, das überhaupt zu können, die Kinder zurückzuholen und ihnen ein Leben zu geben mit Zukunft? Uh, 
Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for this question. Um, I've worked a lot on issues that have to do, on various issues, but one of the issues has been the issue of child soldiers. And uh, there has been one child in particular, uh, Norman Okello. I wrote a book about him. Um, and I did over 40 hours of interviews um, with this one man. Very often location interviews. So we went, um, we went all over northern Uganda. We went to to South Sudan, even to various places where things happen in the story. And I think maybe to answer this question, I, I can answer it with with a bit with his story. Um, Nelson was abducted on the first of January, 1995, uh, when he was 12 years old. He spent two years and a couple of months in LRA captivity. And during this time, my whole book is a very, it's about a very slow transition, about how he, he was a boy, he was innocent, and slowly he was turned into this monster, this killing machine, this, this guy that, um, that could be very dangerous and that could have anger attacks, could explode, and was genuinely a very dangerous man by the time he came back. He came back at the age of 14, but uh, he, he no longer considered himself a child anymore. It was a situation in which the LRA gives guns to young boys, and all of a sudden young boys, when they go back into the civilian society, uh, these young boys, they have power. They come from a situation where, as young boys in the gender setting, uh, they have very little power, and suddenly they get guns. They get. They are given power over civilians. Um, the whole gender um, situation in, in Uganda was turned upside down. Um, there's always the fear, there's always, he was tortured many times. The first time he was, he was forced to kill somebody was when uh, they captured somebody that tried to escape. They brought him in front of him and he was together with a few other people, he was forced to kill this boy. Um, and he was forced to kill this boy as kind of a lesson uh, that if you ever try to escape, this is what will happen to you. Um, and then that was the first time, and it happens over and over and over again. So by the time that he came back after two years, um, his mindset had completely changed. And as much as his parents were extremely happy to see him again uh, and happy that he returned, uh, the parents were also extremely afraid of him. Um, and I think that fear that the parents have had of their own child was, was a justified fear because at times when he got angry, he started to destroy things. When I was doing my interviews, especially at the verse, very beginning, uh, sometimes we were doing an interview and in the middle of the interview, he stood up and he started running away. And I kind of wonder like, wow, that's... That's a strong reaction. So the next day I asked him, so why, why did you run away? And he told me that if he wouldn't have run away, then that even my life as an interviewer might have been in danger because he was getting a rage attack. And whenever he gets one of these rage attacks, he just wants to destroy everything. So instead of destroying, he started to run. Uh, and that is what he did. And for him, like he had complete insomnia. He could never, ever sleep um, at night because at night constantly the dreams came back and he was haunting and everything that he did in the bush came back when he was trying to get asleep. Um, so it took, him, it took him a considerably long time to get over it. And I think one of the main things, which he also recognized later on, what helped him to get over it was all the interviews that we actually did. Like, I did over 40 hours of interviews and usually at night uh, he talked into his voice recorder um, about his story and I think slowly being confronted with his own uh, with his own history, he's he slowly got to terms with it. Um, and interestingly, these days um, he walks around with a gun once more in the city center of Kampala as a police officer. Um, and you would initially think that, wow, that's a bad idea uh, to give this guy um, a gun and do riot control. But um, but I think now it's. It is, he came back in 97, and I think now finally he is convinced that he's completely over it. He's over his traumas, and it took him 15 years. And 
as Grace can say, like at the end of the conflict, everybody in northern Uganda had, everybody was traumatized. Everybody had witnessed or done horrible things. Um, so the whole society was defragmented. Um, and the whole society was, um, had a big problem. Um, but that was the reality then. And I think if we look at northern Uganda now, um, there are still a lot of problems that remain, but but it's peaceful um, and it is developing slowly. Problems that remain are, there are still many children that are missing. The parents still don't know what happened to him. Grace just gave an example of this. Um, but there are tens of thousands, if not more. Um, so there are still a lot of problems, but slowly the society is rebuilding itself. Um, and slowly Uganda is coming to terms with, with its own past. Trotzdem, nicht trotzdem, aber der Versuch, Frage erst Grace, ähm, im Film konnte man aus meiner Sicht nicht erkennen, inwiefern Jungs und Mädchen geschlechterdifferenziert Probleme haben, mit der Situation umzugehen. Heute im Nachmittag im Fachgespräch haben wir aber darüber gesprochen, dass Jungs, junge Männer mit anderen Problemen konfrontiert sind als äh, junge Mädchen und junge Frauen. Ich fände das ganz gut, wenn du, Grace, noch mal beschreiben würdest, was es für Mädchen bedeutet, in die Familien zurückzukehren oder in die soziale Umgebung und was es für junge Männer bedeutet. Und ich würde das auch gerne noch mal dann Theo fragen. Yeah, with the returnees, when you look at um, both female and the, the male returnees, it's, it's really a big challenge for female returnees compared to male returnees because uh, most of them came back with children. And then uh, being mother of children that... Uh, are born in captivity, they also become victims because they are looked at as children of the perpetrators. And this has uh, made it quite difficult for reintegration of these um, uh, children born in captivity and then uh, also community attitude to, to accept them. And uh, when we look at the, for the male returnees, of course, the level of rejection is very high on the male returnees because most of them were directly involved and they somehow cited so a lot, many times. So many of them who feel unsafe in their community got uh, relocated elsewhere, or some of them joined the military, the government military, and just work with the, with the government army, because they cannot, they don't feel safe to be in their community. But for those who manage to settle in their community, uh, the traditional leaders, uh, the cultural leaders also played a very vital role in helping deal with the situation of uh, stigma and then uh, uh, internal conflict caused by the war through community, family dialogue, um, where people are able to express their grievances together with the returnee and see a proper way of handling the old situation. So cultural leaders played uh, a big role in helping the, the, the reintegration of, uh, of these returnees. But then uh, when we look at this, um, the returning mothers, in many cases they get into relationship when they come back. And that is one positive thing that we feel is it has to happen with uh, with returnees. If they get into relationship, that is another way of coping that we feel should be encouraged. But then, in many cases, they are reminded of their past. 
even their children that the, the children that they return with from the bush are always reminded. Uh, we talk about forgiveness, but um, forgiveness is not in totality. Depending on individual attitudes, sometimes we can't say, uh, you know, the cultural leaders say we should forgive and we have forgiven. What actually people believe in so much is that uh, when you when you when you come straight forward, share what you have done and apologized for what you have done, it's very easy to 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 forgive. But then. These individual children who go in their different community, you never know what might happen. And like any other person, a, a returnee or a returnee mother may make a mistake, like any other person who is not abducted. But then whatever they do, they are, it, it's always reflected in, in, in their past that you know she behaves like this because she kills so many people. She has brought the mentality she had in the bush. But then also internally, we have a law. Okay, it's not a, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of uh, a rules and uh, even legally it's not right to, 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 to abuse or intimidate a returnee. If you do that, you are imprisoned for seven years. But then this stigma is, is, is very silent and it's the most painful one because uh, it's very hard to to know who did this. But also what we do is um, we try to carry out a case-by-case case management. We hear about a case about a returnee, we go straight to that individual or family and see how we settle the problem in, instead of uh, maybe coming out with it in open awareness raising because it is not possible to do that since all people in northern region underwent the same problem. And you're talking now about returnees, yet there are others who suffered the same problem or more than someone who came back from a, a captivity in terms of being, uh, getting the grave uh, uh, injury or the, 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 uh, the, 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 the mouth has been cut, the arms have been cut, and now you are saying, please accept the returnees, yet everyone suffered the same, and no one has been recognized or really seen as, uh, recognized in the community as someone who has been seriously affected by the world. So it, it's very hard for us to, to come up and talk about um, um, community accepting returnees. But what we do is just handling case by case, since many people also suffer the same problem and they need the same kind of uh, mental rehabilitation. Um, I think generally f most child soldiers that I've ever talked with, um, every single one had difficulties in the reintegration process and every single one faced stigmatization, discrimination from the community. Um, I think a difference between men and women, but before going into this, maybe it's, it's I should say something about the nature of the LRA. The LRA is not just um, an armed group or a rebel movement. It's much more than that. It's a, it is a very excluded and unique society uh, that has its own religion, um, even its own uh, prophet. Kony is the prophet of their uh, religion. It, has, it is a group with their own sets of rules, with their own norms, with their own uh, laws and everything. So it is a society in itself. And everybody gets that gets abducted is becomes a part of this society and to a certain extent also adopts the norms and the values of that society um most of the girls that get abducted um if they are very young they become what they call ting things and ting things is a is a housemate or like it's a ting thing is assigned to a certain commander and the ting thing is supposed to clean the house and do all these things once she's old enough, and old enough means what, like 12 or 
11, something like that. Um, then she ceases to be a Ting Ting and she becomes a wife. Um, so she's married off and that immediately comes with um, with sexual violence. She needs to perform sexual uh, duties and these girls are expected to become mothers. Um, so they carry the next generation of LRA fighters. So some of these girls at the age of 15, they have already given birth twice um, or once or, or whatever. And many of the girls that get abducted, the LRA had their bases in South Sudan, so not in northern Uganda. And to escape from South Sudan was extremely challenging because not only was the LRA hunting you, but if the, the Sudanese government would find you, you would be killed. If the Sudanese rebels would find you, you would be killed. If civilians would find you, they would kill you. And if wild animals would find you, they would probably also kill you. So basically everything that you came across uh, that was alive uh, was trying to kill you. Too. So to escape from South Sudan was extremely difficult. And as a result, many of the girls that were abducted stayed in captivity for a very long time. So by the time they came back, if they came back, um, they all very often escaped with several children. And if they survived their escape, and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that the vast majority did not survive, but for the ones that did survive and that did come back, they faced a unique set of problems in that they came back with uh, one or several children. And there were many occasions where the parents were happy to see the girl again, and they would accept the girl back into the family. But they told the girl, okay, you are welcome back, but we don't want your child because um, we don't recognize that child as, as being a grandchild of ours. Um, and then these girls basically had a choice to either abandon the child or, or to abandon the family and, and go live somewhere else with the child. Um, so in many ways, the girls had an additional problem in their reintegration process because of the children that they come, came back with. Um, it not, it's not only, neg like, not only negative, the, the children also gave the girls um, companionship, uh, they gave the women strength to fight, like all the female returnees that I interviewed um, that came back with children said that their children gave them a purpose, um, a reason to live uh, and a reason to fight. Um, so it also gave additional opportunities within their reintegration process, but it also very often um, made it more difficult in that the child was also a constant reminder of what happened to them, to the bush, and not only a reminder for themselves, but also for the surrounding community. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, let me stop there. Vielen Dank, äh, soweit Grace und äh, Theo. Ich möchte jetzt ähm, Janelle Galvanek ins, ähm, in die Runde einführen. Einfach deshalb, weil äh, Janelle sich ähm, beschäftigt als Wissenschaftlerin bei der Berghof Stiftung unter anderem ja genau mit der Interaktion zwischen staatlichen und nicht staatlichen Akteuren, die sich äh, eben unter anderem auch mit der Reintegration von Kindersoldatinnen und Soldaten beschäftigt und äh, aus der Perspektive nicht nur einer Wissenschaftlerin, die am Schreibtisch sitzt, sondern auch Erfahrungen vor allem in Konfliktregionen in subsahara afrika ähm, Ahnung hat, äh, würde mich jetzt einfach an Sie die Frage interessieren, wie Sie und jetzt sind wir bei den Akteuren. Wer macht den Aufarbeitungsarbeit? Wer macht Postkonfliktbearbeitung? Äh, Bin ich einfach bei dem Thema. Ähm, wie sehen Sie denn das Wechselspiel zwischen staatlichen und nicht staatlichen Akteuren, sowohl vor Ort in den jeweiligen Regionen als auch international, wenn es darum geht, an der Reintegration von Kindersoldaten und Soldatinnen zu arbeiten. Wir werden dann später noch auf die globale Ebene kommen, aber jetzt erstmal zu diesem Thema. Ja? Thank you very much for the invitation to be here tonight. Um, a few words um, about reintegration processes in general worldwide. Um, as every conflict is unique in the world. Every reintegration process is unique for those who are fighting in it. Um, specifically as well, um, every conflict is unique that has child soldiers. Um, child soldiers fight in various groups, paramilitaries, um, 
classic rebel groups um, with national armies, such as in Myanmar, that um, has the biggest group of child soldiers fighting today. Um, and they're fighting for different reasons, and they've been recruited for different reasons, and a lot of them have volunteered to escape um, lives of poverty, hopelessness, abuse at home, planned marriages. Um, so every reintegration process has to take these aspects into consideration. Um, we spoke a lot this afternoon at the expert discussion about how important it is to involve local people in the reintegration process. Uh, specifically, if the reintegration process is a classic DDR um, case uh, implemented by the UN, and DDR I mean demobilization, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration process. These are processes that are often implemented in post-conflict countries um, by the UN or um, sometimes the national um, governments. And each process is different. It's They often have um, very, the, the same aspects. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the international actors think that whatever happened or whatever worked in this conflict can, can be transferred to this conflict, which is um, clearly not always the case. Um, so it's important to use as much uh, local um, understanding, local capacity, uh, local um, um, yeah, capacity is, as needed specifically in, in conflicts that, are, um, you, that use a lot of child soldiers. Um, we see that um, this has happened in many cases, for instance, just a, just a quick example about Liberia. Um, the reintegration process there was implemented by UNICEF, so technically it was implemented by the, the international community, but uh, it was local NGOs on the ground that were responsible for the entire reintegration process. Um, and this is, this is really important, and most specifically about local agency of the kids. It's really important to get the kids involved in this process, find out what they need, what they want, there have been cases of reintegration programs that teach uh, children vocational skills that they don't need. For instance, um, how to uh, be a mechanic in areas of Liberia where there are for few cars. Um, so it's very important to look at what, what the kids actually need and what they want. Um, and um, so I would say that, that that's the most important thing. I'll leave it there. We will continue on that level. Um, ich möchte jetzt um, unsere Vertreterin, sage ich jetzt mal, aus, äh, aus Brüssel. Herzlich willkommen heißen, Susanna Sjutjakova. Habe ich das richtig ausgesprochen, hoffentlich. Äh, sie arbeitet äh, mit dem äh, External Service äh, der Europäischen Union. Das ist ja so etwas wie der Versuch, ein Außenministerium aufzubauen in Brüssel. Auch Frau Sudjakova ist äh, seit 2006 in der EU aktiv, äh, in ganz unterschiedlichen äh, Funktionen. Ähm, sie ist jetzt äh, die Koordinatorin ähm, derjenigen Institutionen, die in der Europäischen Union zum Thema Kinder in bewaffneten Konflikten arbeiten. Und sie hat eben auch den, äh, die, die Aufgabe, humanitäre Hilfe in der Entwicklungszusammenarbeit in diesem Kontext ähm, zu koordinieren. Sie sitzt der EU-Taskforce vor, die sich mit Kindern in bewaffneten Konflikten beschäftigt. Äh, sicherlich ganz gut, wenn Sie uns kurz, äh, Susanna, sagen, was ist das für eine Aufgabe, diese Koordinationsaufgabe, die Sie da machen. Sie sind ja in der zentralen Funktion auf europäischer Ebene, sich mit Kindern, die betroffen sind von bewaffneten Konflikten und damit sind es ja auch Kindersoldatinnen und Soldaten, die sind ja von Konflikten betroffen. Was machen Sie da? Was können Sie tun? Wie sind Sie involviert in Reintegration und in andere Aufgaben? Thank you very much and uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I, it was the first time that I've seen this film and it was really a very powerful testimony and uh, I think that this um, gives us good reason to continue basically in, in our efforts. So as you correctly pointed out, I'm working with the European External Action Service and um, in that capacity I'm trying, I'm overseeing um, the EU policy on children armed conflict. And um, I have to say that um, 
in the EU, this is one of the old, oldest uh, human rights policies which we have developed since 2003. We have developed EU guidelines on the children arm conflict. And since then, we have reviewed um, and revisited our policy. Uh, and I have to say that as of today, we don't used to speak about child soldiers exclusively because we learned a very important lesson that we need to work with children affected by armed conflict in general because it's very often if we focus only on child soldiers, especially in the reintegration efforts, then we can create a, basically a new problems in the community level because we can stigmatize these children. Sometimes they are perceived you know, as being rewarded for everything what they have done in the in the in the bush, um, let's say. So we have really rev revisited our policy, and we are trying to, uh, in our especially in our assistance, we are trying to address and work with um, all children affected by the armed conflict, not only those who were um, associated with armed groups or with the um, armed forces. I mean, governmental armed forces. Um, I think I should say that in the EU um, we have a different instruments to to um, actually act and to um, address the situation of children, child soldiers and children affected by armed conflict. There are different levels. So that at the global level, um, we as an EU we are trying to further develop the protection si international protection system and um, which is basically very much centered around the Security Council. Of course, the EU as such is not the member of Security Council, but our member states are. And we are coordinating the policy. And I have to say that Germany played a very important role during the presidency in the Security Council. Um, we are, as an EU, um, uh, very much behind the mandate of the special representative uh, on children armed conflict and we are trying to prolong uh, this mandate because it's very important to, mo to monitor all the um, uh, violations of human rights. Um, we are also trying to um, uh, hold the states accountable and to um, remind them of their obligations because we, you mentioned uh, in your introduction that we have certain international rules and norms and I think that it's very important to remind the states that they have to comply uh, with these norms. So we are doing a lot of uh, lobbying and awareness raising. Um, but I would say that the, maybe the most important aspect is the assistance, uh, the humanitarian assistance, which is uh, very much activated in the very first early phases of the conflict, but also our development assistance, which is then focused more on reintegration, rehabilitation efforts. And as I mentioned, we are trying to review our policies. We realize that it's very much important to work also on preventive side, not only in responsive side. So there are many vulnerabilities um, in the societies, for example, street children, um, children living in the camps, etc., who are more exposed to, um, um, to being recruited or you know, to, to different forms of, um, of exploitation. So we are really, one of the lessons is that we need to break more on preventive side. Get this? Yeah. Heute, im, heute Nachmittag im Fachgespräch habe ich gelernt, dass äh, viele der staatlichen Programme, aber auch Programme von Hilfsorganisationen äh, sich allzu häufig an spezielle Opfergruppen richten. Ja, nur die kind, ich sage jetzt in Anführungszeichen, nur die Kindersoldaten, die Eltern werden aber draußen gelassen. Ähm, ich würde jetzt gerne auch wirklich äh, von allen hier ähm, mal ganz konkret wissen wollen, wie, sich, wie Sie die Programme, die von staatlichen und nicht staatlichen Akteuren bei der Reintegration, bei der Aufarbeitung von Konflikten, wie die in der Region ankommen. Was ist da gut und was ist da dran problematisch? Ich würde gerne mit Theo anfangen. Äh, ja, das war eine große Frage. Um, one of the things that I said this afternoon is um, very often certain conflicts seem to have their narrative, their dominant narrative. Um, and if you looked at 
the conflict that happened in northern Uganda, the, the narrative was child soldiers. Um, and anybody that, that heard about that war heard about the issue of children being abducted and children fighting the war. And that narrative became so extremely strong that a lot of the funding regime went only into this problem. And a lot of the organization that came came with a, with a sole function uh, a sole focus on the problem of, of the child soldiers. While the child soldiers were just like, it was one problem out of very many. Um, if you look at Eastern DRC, where I've also worked, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I think that the narrative on the Congo is largely twofold. It's like one hand, it's, it, it's focused on minerals, um, on conflict related minerals, and on the other hand, um, it is about sexual violence and uh, rape of women. Um, and as a result, most of the organizations that come in um, have a very strong focus on those issues. And if you want to do any kind of project within the DRC, um, then you are better off to put something about sexual violence in the title of your proposal because the chances that you will get the money to, to do anything uh, becomes much higher. Um, and so, in this way, every or most conflicts get their narrative, and according to the narrative, that is also where the money is, where the donors focus on, where the media focus on, everybody focus on this, those issues. And very often, those things uh, go at a cost of other issues. Um, and the DRC is, is stunning. Like everybody is focusing on... Um, on the consequences of sexual violence, but for some reason nobody seems to be focusing on the causes of sexual violence. Um, everybody wants to start a, a, a hospital and treat women that have fistula and, and all these horrible things, and, and there's nothing against that. Like it's, it's very important work, but nobody seems to be focusing on what is the core issue here um, and what is actually what is causing all this sexual violence. Um, and what is causing all the other violence, because sexual violence is only one form of violence in very many forms of violence, and, and it's maybe not even the biggest form of violence. Um, and I think that is often a problem um, within this world. Media needs to sell a story, but media needs to sell it in such a way that people can understand it, so they need to simplify it. Governments like to have simple stories, simple solutions, so that they can design yeah, simple, simple interventions, five bullet points, not more, um, so that we can understand it. And I think that is one of the one of the big problems when we are working on issues like these. Um, they are all always based on very simplistic narratives, um, and as a result, you end up with interventions that are also not tackling the broader issues. Ja, wir sind schon im, im, im Bereich, ähm, was, was muss sich ändern, was muss äh, konkreter gemacht werden. Äh, Theo hat ja jetzt noch mal das Wort geredet. Komplexe Situationen brauchen ähm, komplexe... Does it, does it work? Okay. Bra komplexe Situationen brauchen auch komplexe Antworten, da sie ja sowohl staatliche als auch nicht staatliche Akteure äh, beobachten. Chanel, äh, würde mich einfach interessieren, ob Sie ähnliche Beobachtungen machen wie Theo, Hollander, oder gibt es da noch anderes zu sagen, wie fragmentiert und eben überhaupt nicht kontextualisiert, ähm, gerade auch nicht staatliche und staatliche Akteure dann in die Länder gehen und hier und da einen Tropfen auf den heißen Stein bringen und manchmal Probleme eher noch verschlimmern. Um, I fully agree with Theo. I agree with everything he said. I can only emphasize that. Um, just a few other points about sort of bringing this all together in terms of reintegration and preventative measures. Um, it's very much all connected. And I think that when you think about reintegration in, an, in a post-conflict situation and reintegration in an ongoing conflict situation, these are two totally different things. You can see from the situation in Uganda that these children who were being reintegrated were terrified of getting abducted again. So a reintegration process that's going on in a conflict like this is much different than something 
that we experienced a lot, for instance, on the African continent in the last decade or so, where a lot of conflicts came to an end, hopefully for good. Um, so back to going back to what Susanna said, I think it's really important to start looking more preventative. So thinking about it makes a, no sense if we're going to reintegrate these kids if there's a chance that they're going to get abducted again. Not that it makes no sense, but it's, it's risky. Um, so we need to do, it, more, interact more with these groups, these um, groups, state and non-state actors who are using the child soldiers in order to try to get them out and get them reintegrated and make sure that they're not going to be recruited again. And there are different approaches to that. Um, the UN um, takes a, a naming and shaming approach they have a, the monitoring and reporting mechanism that they have that lists uh, perpetrators of, of uh, child violence. Perpetrate, there, I think there's six, there's six crimes listed. Um, and they put them on this, this list. Uh, they have, I think, 32 persistent perpetrators on their list. There is an inherent limitation, however, with this process because most of the um, persistent perpetrators are non-state armed groups. There are a few state actors on there, like the Myanmar government, and these actors can enter into a so-called action plan with the UN in order to um, admit, acknowledge that they use child soldiers and then um, try to get themselves delisted once they no longer use child soldiers. But this is also very tricky because the UN is not able to interact with a lot of the non-state armed groups that are on the list. For instance, you need to have the approval of the state in order to uh, interact with these non-state armed groups. So for instance, in Myanmar, in Colombia, the state refuses to let the UN interact with these groups. So there are a lot of limitations to, to this system, uh, the system of naming and shaming. It, it does work to a certain extent to achieve certain things, but there obviously needs to be better approaches to this. One specific approach is, is the organization called Geneva Call in Switzerland. They're known for working with non-state armed groups on the issue of landmines, and they have had a lot of success and they have uh, chosen in the last few years to branch out and uh, go to the topic of, of child soldiers, and they have started working with the non-state armed groups that they already have contact with about landmines. So the, the trust is there, the relationship is there, and they've had also a few, uh, a few cases of success as well. Um, in this sense, it's similar to an action plan. It's called a deed of commitment that they enter into with these non-state non -state armed groups um, to try to um, uh, pledge that they will no longer use child soldiers. It has had a, f a, a good deal of success. Um, one, for instance, one case is the Karen uh, National Liberation Army. This is a group in Myanmar. It's an ethnic group that has been fighting Myanmar government for, for, for decades uh, for more autonomy, uh, for more justice, more rights for their people. Um, they have been extremely isolated over the last few decades. So they are, the Karen group in general is not so aware of the rules and regulations of international law. So in this sense, it, it's, it's a much different case than the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda where they are um, fighting for the rights and, of their people and anyone at the age of 16 is expected to go and join this army. Um, so there's, there is a lot being done in that sense. Of course, with, when it comes to the Lord's Resistance Army, it's a very predatory group. It's very hard to interact with them and it's, uh, there's very limited options with working for them, with, with them. Ja, thank you so much. Um, meine nächste Frage geht nochmal an Susanne. Um, ah, Sie sind gleich dran. Ich mache gleich auf nach dieser Runde. Nochmal auch von Ihnen. Ich meine, Sie koordinieren jetzt eine Taskforce, die sich mit Kindern, die von Konflikten betroffen sind, Sie können Glück haben, wenn Sie die 28 EU-Länder dazu einigermaßen nur für, dieses eine, für diese Zielgruppe koordiniert bekommen. Für uns aber ist auch interessant zu wissen, können Sie mit Ihrer Task Group und dem Wissen, was Sie haben, auch durchdringen zu Entscheidungsträgern, die sich mehr mit den Wurzeln und den Ursachen von Konflikten beschäftigen sollten innerhalb der EU, zum Beispiel sind Sie in der Lage zu adressieren, dass Waffenlieferungen aus EU-Ländern Konflikte verschärfen und den Kindern Waffen in die Hand geben, mit denen sie töten müssen? Haben Sie Einfluss innerhalb der EU dann auch auf die Außenpolitik? Ähm, zumindest nicht Einfluss, aber gehört zu werden, auch mit Ihren Erfahrungen. Thank you very much. And indeed, it's, um, it's quite a difficult question. 
Um, I have to say that um, in our task force we haven't dis uh, discussed ATT um, and um, it is discussed in other group, non-proliferation group. But um, the point which I wanted to make is that we do have in the EU a code of conduct on uh, trade with the arms. And there we have a clear human rights standard. So the, in principle, I mean, the legislation, I mean, you know, the framework is there. Now it's also about the implementation. But if I could come back a little bit on what also other um, speakers mentioned, because you were, and you were asking it as well, it's about having a more, uh, you know, coordinated and comprehensive uh, response. And I think in that context, yes, um, I think we are trying to to improve. This came out also of our review of the of our policy in 2010. And so uh, while we are trying now to work on preventive and also responsive side and to include not only development assistance but also tools related to, for example, cr crisis management. So at the same time when we are and we have good examples, for example, in DRC on that. But we are engaged on the humanitarian side, we are engaged on development side. So, for example, uh, when we are speaking about child soldiers or children affected by, by armed conflict, um, this is not only done through specific actions through the NGOs in the field, but we are also trying to work through the security sector reforms, through the justice sector reform. This is extremely important because in the east uh, part of Congo, basically there are no um, instructions as an institution. So it's also institutions building. Um, it's um, um, trying to give, uh, for example, um, free legal aid so that children, uh, so that children or uh, women victims can actually claim justice. Um, it is working on the health sector reform, so that uh, we are improving also these aspects. It's working on the promotion of education, etc. So through this is the second part of um, of our actions through the development aid, and then um, we have two crisis management operation in the DRC. One is working with the Ministry of um, uh, Ministry of Interior. Another is working with the Ministry of Defence, where we are basically having advisors. Um, in the ministries and trying to promote the reforms like accountability, you know, uh, codes of conduct, um, uh, vetting mechanism, etc. Um, so I think that there are still loopholes, but we are definitely trying to um, make a more comprehensive response uh, to, to the issue of, of um, uh, child soldiers. I would like to just, if I may, <laughs> I will abuse the fact that I have a micro. Um, um, well, we are, uh, we are um, communicating with the governments, trying to, for example, uh, we are now trying to support a uh, special representative in her new initiative, actually to stop recruitment and use of um, children by government armed forces by 2016. So we are trying to work on this area. But at the same time, I think that it's also possible to, um, to um, somehow engage um, um, on the other front, and it is on non-state um, actors. And this is what we are currently discussing in the EU. Um, of course, there are some non-state actors which, uh, with whom we, we can't really uh, discuss, uh, you know, exactly LRA, but there are also other examples, Al-Qaeda, etc. cetera. Uh, well, um, <laughs> well, yeah, well, so, uh, but there are others which are actually, which uh, showed a readiness to engage, even in the UN process, for example, in Philippines. Um, and, um, I think that we should now see how we can engage also through assistance and help also um, uh, those non-state actors who are willing to uh, release children. So I, I think I was sharing this micro. So um, ich habe Ihnen versprochen, dass Sie Ihre Frage gleich oder Ihren Kommentar stellen dürfen. Sagen Sie bitte, wer Sie sind. Das Mikro kommt zu Ihnen. Ins Mikro muss gesprochen werden wegen der Übersetzung. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Antwo Bogner. Um, uh, recently conducted a research project on uh, post-conflict development and conflict transformation in in uh, another 
region of northern Uganda in West Nile, where you had the d different rebel groups and where you had a peace process um, after a the signing of the peace accord in 2002. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, in, in my own research, I found out that the, the situation in this adjacent region of northern Uganda is very different from uh, what has been described about uh, the central north and the area of operation of the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, for example, in West Nile, the whole problem of post-conflict development is largely, uh, in a way, dominated by a narrative that says a rebellion is caused by poverty and marginalization, regional marginalization. So all we need to do now is to fight poverty and to bring development to this marginalized backward region. That is how we uh, do conflict prevention and peace building and post-conflict reconstruction. And nobody's talking about the, the, the victims of the war and the victims of war crimes committed either by the rebels or committed by uh, the government army. Uh, and there is a, a lot a lot of problems connected to this because it was the home region of Idi Amin and uh, when Idi Amin's regime ended, um, the, the, the new, the, the, the armed forces that came, the new armed forces of the coming government that was taking power at the time came into this region and they were taking revenge. And so we have a long history of violence and counter violence in this region. And uh, I, I see two, two problems, uh, uh, one of the biggest problems I see is an, a discourse or the prevalence of discourses that try to depoliticize the problems. I mean, for example, uh, I find the term, um, you, now in the literature, it's, um, there are suggestions to replace the term child soldier by the term war affected children. But everybody, every, almost every child in northern Uganda or in Uganda is, at least in northern Uganda, is a war-affected child, every child, uh, or everybody who was a child at the time of the fighting. So uh, in a way, it, uh, um, it homogenizes the, the problem in a way that I think is not not justifiable because the problems that these uh, 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 persons have that we have seen in the film, they, they are different from other persons who were not abducted, who were not forced to become child soldiers, even if they became witnesses to horrible atrocities too, or if their school education has been uh, hindered uh, due to the war situation, and so on and so forth. Uh, that nevertheless, the problems are different, and it is a euphemism to call, to call all, all of them, uh, to put them into the box or the under the label of war-affected children. Even the term child soldiers is you know, a euphemism for the child soldiers of the Lord's Resistance Army. In many conflicts of the world, rebels or um, also government armies, are using minors as combatants. But this doesn't mean that they are always forced to commit atrocities, to torture age mates, um, sometimes to, to, to kill relatives, uh, people from neighbors, okay. and so on and so forth. So, uh, well, uh, as I said, I think one of the, the major problems is, is the discourse that mm -hmm. tries, in a way, to depoliticize. I already got reactions to your comment from the panel, so okay. we, we, are, we are going to have an engaged debate. Please. Thank you. Thank you <coughs> for your comment. Um, 
I, I would say that there are um, there's definitely a trend to get away from the word child soldier. I've heard youth combatants. I've heard um, children combatants. I've heard underage combatants. I've heard this and that. Um, I don't think that there's a tr uh, an um, a move towards labeling child uh, lumping together in one group child soldiers or, or children that have been um, taken part in hostilities and war affected children. I think that they are two quite different groups and I think there's a recognition of that. I think what the problem is is that a lot of children who have been fighting, who come home and get reintegration benefits, um, are then further stigmatized in their own societies because they get to go to school for free or they get their school books for free or they get vocational training. And these are the things that all other kids in the community also need. So the so what was what's intended as a very positive thing to help these kids reintegrate in their societies ends up hurting them because they are not allowed to reintegrate within their societies well, amongst other kids that, that need these things as well. I don't have the best solution for this. I think that the, the international community is, is working on it, but I think there is a recognition that these are two very different groups of people. War affected children, yes, absolutely, in Northern Uganda, everybody's affected by war, but they don't need the same psychosocial treatment or trauma treatment that, that kids that, that fought actually need. So, uh, but I think that there is a need to be, you know, as we talked about, do no harm, there needs to be really care taken that you're not doubly stigmatizing these kids for having fought. And one just very last comment, specifically in a conflict that is ongoing. If kids that did not fight see kids come back that did fight and all of a sudden they're going to school or they're getting vocational training, that's incentive to fight. Often in conflicts where it's not so brutal. And that's a very important point. Yeah, yeah, Grace. Uh, yeah, I would like to ask Grace uh, how you look at this dilemma. Yeah, that from one hand you need special treatment for those who are traumatized, and on the other hand, you are probably endangering them as well. You know, because, because or stigmatize them. So just the issue on the table here. Yeah, in reality, everyone in northern Uganda has been a victim and still suffers the consequence of the war. But uh, looking at the, the gravity of the, the impact of this war, everyone, of course, is, has been affected. But then uh, there are others who are gravely affected. And that that's why, because of lack of resources, we can't just take everyone at the same time to be uh, supported or given the, 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 the support necessary. Um, many organizations majorly uh, give support according to uh, the, the, the level of vulnerability. And as you said, in Northern Uganda, the issue of returning, calling them returnees or child soldiers is no longer there. We want them to integrate by not um, labeling them in the community that uh, this, this one came from the bush. What we normally do as uh, local NGOs around and any other organization that comes to support is that we identify individuals and group as uh, people of vulnerability. We only look at vulnerability, not only war, only war vulnerability, but different kind of vulnerability, we put them together to give that kind of support. But even still, we, if we talk about uh, level of vulnerability, we are still driven back to look at women and children. We try to so much not focus on men, which has become a challenge because uh, the focus that uh, we are uh, intervention has turned to women it's for a noble cause. It's for an important cause that need to be dealt with. But then, on the other hand, is disabling the men and creating uh, uh, more problem, especially domestic violence. So, the 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 the, the, the initiatives that uh, NGO always come up with is to try as much as possible not to initiate programs that. Uh, create more division and conflict uh, between those ones who were abducted and those ones who were not abducted. We just handle them as people who need help. 
But then when you look at the situation in northern Uganda, as I earlier said, the level of poverty is high. And this one, whoever go to Uganda, when you travel from the city to northern Uganda, you just see that there is injustice somewhere. There's no way, even however much you're blind, the potholes you move through, the kind of life you see people, the kind of building you see people are living in, shows that there's something still not fair to the, to, to the people in northern region. So it is something that we need to also pay attention to. And northern Uganda, looking at the situation of poverty, it creates more vulnerability the majority, if most of you maybe know, Northern Uganda, I mean Uganda has the majority of young people. And looking at the situation of Northern Uganda, if this is not help, the redundancy of the youths is another, is another, it may cause another conflict because young people can 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 really come up and carry out uh, another uprising because they have nothing to do. So we we need a lot of uh, uh, intervention that could that can really help the youth come out of their problem. But then when you see most of the programs that are initiated, youths are not young people are not involved all over the country. Very few young people are involved. I want to just conclude what I have to say about uh, today's meeting and then doesn't stop anyone from asking me questions. Uh, what I see is that um, she talked about um, uh, arm control. It is very important that uh, the, the world has come up with the uh, controlling um, circulation in the uh, around the world, but then uh, we have countries that make their own weapons, and uh, you don't know how they make them, how many they make, and where it's supplied. And then when we look at the Western world, their role is to make it supply. But uh, uh, I would say that uh, these guns are not used so much in the West. It's used in developing countries who are struggling, uh, that are struggling for power in Africa. This is a big issue. It's a very serious issue that needs to be dealt with. Uh, I think if guns are to be made, then they should also try to, those who manufacture guns, they should also build uh, a, a, a better field because this is too much for the ordinary people. You find that people who don't know about the war, uh, the, the, the conflict, innocent people, innocent civilians are the ones to suffer. So if more guns are being made, then they should also build a better field for it, not to kill the innocent people. Then secondly, as you talk about, uh, this is the time that reintegration is taking place, I mean, re uh, rehabilitation of the, uh, the ruined northern Uganda is taking place, and we are in the transitional period. And in this case, a lot of violation take place. And that's why the legal system has to be improved. The government has to improve its system. The policy within has to be improved. But um, when you look at, uh, the international community, the way they are forced to channel their funding, they need to also be so curious because uh, spend money that are channeled through the government, it may help, but before it reach the grassroots to benefit the ordinary people, it's already fragmented into, you know, just quarter of it reach the the very people who need to, 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 to benefit from. So if international community donors could really focus so much in channeling their funds straight to the respective grassroots people where they are affected would be much better. And then in education, 
these children have returned from the bush, they need education. And uh, internationally, we have the primary free, uh, free education and the primary uh, yeah, education. But um, when we talk about this free education, how much is it impacting the, the, the people? Because if it's about basic education, what about basic education? Where will it take them? Will it fight poverty? I don't think this will help because this education, some children also reach primary uh, seven, doesn't know how to read and write even a mere name. So what use of this education? So education should be not just uh, basic, but if international, the, the only way that we can control or stop conflict is making people educated, making people know what is best for them. And like me, myself, before I came to Germany, I stayed only one month. But in my stay in Australia, in the nine months that I was in Australia, I've learned a lot. It was like I'm, I'm, I'm a literate person. But when I came, I was able to learn a lot. I, 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 my thinking that I used to think just under my feet, I now think widely. And I, I, I don't think violently, but I think positively on how I can develop my community. So education, proper education, help a lot to reduce conflict in a, a, a fragile uh, a country. And then uh, also looking at program sustainability. Program can be initiated in the community. International community can pour a lot of money in the community or in developing country. But when this money is being sent in the community, do we mind about the sustainability? Do we mind how much it impacts the people that have been uh, channeled to? So these are things that has to be questioned, not just pouring money that we send this amount and this accountability has been uh, given to us. Something has to be done more than that. Uh, in Northern Uganda, if I'm to reflect, right now, if you are to go, you will find nothing other than signposts, a lot of signposts scattered along the roadside. We did this, we did this. Go to this community, ask them, see how they live, the kind of life they live, it's like nothing has been done. Yet over 100 organizations in Kitkum, if I would say alone, has done a lot of work, I, they say. I, I used to say, uh, to tell myself that um, if not, if not just anything, if I could pull all these signposts and then sell them, pay school fees for these orphans who are just at home without education. And then the t-shirts that are being printed in expensive, uh, in, 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 in expensive mall in the city, the money goes back to investors. I wish these t-shirts are uh, sold somewhere and the money help to pay for vulnerable children, orphans, and feed families who stay angry. And then uh, lastly, I would say, as the late Mandela said, never again. And this documentary of today should only help us to say never again should it happen. And in this case, international community, together with individual, we need to give pressure to governments who clings to power, who don't want to, to commit themselves to what they sign for in the in the, in, in the UN convention, because other government just sign it because they want their own personal interest. But then the real implementation of what they, are, uh, they, 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 they promise to abide by is practically not there. So if pressure could be given to such uh, government to forcefully change, because has, I, I, I've heard about uh, a, a lot of your role in, you have a lot of voice in doing something to change the way the go governments do their things. If those voices can be really channeled and then making sure, giving them pressure, that condition that 
if this is not done, then something else can happen. I think that would change a lot the way certain things uh, is happening uh, around the world. Because it, it's, it's, it's really something that uh, we, we shouldn't sit back. We need to act. We need to, 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 to do something about it so that uh, the vulnerable people, people who are innocent, come out of this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Ich mache jetzt folgenden Vorschlag. Ich habe noch eine Wortmeldung gesehen. Gibt es noch eine andere? Dann würde ich sagen, ist Rita noch dran? Und dann machen wir eine Schlussrunde. Und dann kann jeder und jede noch mal sagen, auch was sie für Pläne für die Zukunft hat auch im Sinne dessen, was Grace gerade gesagt hat, was gebraucht wird auch von der internationalen Community. Okay, Rita. Ähm, ja, zunächst ähm, die Frage, ähm, die Bezug nimmt auf das gerade Gesagte. Ähm, ein großes Problem ist ja die Korruption, Korruption von Entwicklungsgeldern, ähm, die für gezielte Projekte ähm, gerade zur Reintegration von Kindersoldaten und Soldatinnen ausgegeben werden. Was kann von EU-Seite getan werden? Wie kann Druck ausgeübt werden auf die EU-Länder als große Geber, dass die Korruption in diesem Kontext aufhört und auch, dass die Korruption im Waffenhandel zum Beispiel aufhört? Denn es geht ja nicht nur um den le legalen Waffenhandel, sondern auch um den, der ähm, illegal stattfindet. Das heißt, inwieweit ist das Thema Korruption die Veruntreuung von Geldern, die von Grace gerade angesprochen wurde, auch ein Thema ähm, äh, auf EU-Ebene und inwieweit kann da Einfluss genommen werden. Ähm, dann der zweite Punkt bringt mich nochmal zu dem schönen Titel, der hinter Ihnen steht. Ähm, sexualisierte Gewalt an KindersoldatInnen in bewaffneten Konflikten. Ähm, was mich interessieren würde, auch nochmal an die konkreten Erfahrungs ähm, Ebenen aus Uganda, inwieweit Sie Ansatzmöglichkeiten sehen, ähm, die sexualisierte Gewalt, die Jungen erlebt haben oder junge Männer ähm, bei der Reintegration, ähm, inwieweit die von den Programmen überhaupt erfasst werden kann? Ähm, gibt es von Ihrer Seite ähm, Empfehlungen, die gegeben werden können, auch zum Beispiel an die EU, um dieses Thema sexualisierte Gewalt wirklich aus einer umfassenderen Gender-Perspektive zu sehen. Und ähm, wir haben in dem Film ja sehr viel gesehen über diese traditionellen Riten. Ähm, ist das eigentlich im Sinne der Acholi, zum Beispiel sexualisierte Gewalt an Jungen, durch die Rituale aufzuarbeiten? Fangen wir nochmal von vorne an. Ganz viele Fragen. Ich möchte Sie wirklich bitten, jetzt melden Sie sich noch, aber es ist jetzt wirklich die letzte Runde. Okay, dann gerne Sie noch. Ja, ähm, Dr. Ekins aus Ghana. Ich, ich äh, wollte äh, äh, Grace Bescheid äh, fragen. Er hat zwei Punkte aufgegeben, was man tun kann. Konnten wir, äh, kann kann äh, Grace so diese Punkte schreiben und dann äh, eine Liste machen, sodass... Wir können, äh, wir können haben Leute zu unterschreiben, ja, international zum Beispiel. Er, er, sie war schon in Australien, sie ist in Deutschland. Und dann äh, zum Beispiel der de, de Beschaffen von, de Verkaufen von der de Signal auf der Straße oder die T-Shirts zum Beispiel. Dass man eine, etwas rund bringt und dann wir können unterschreiben. Und wenn wir haben zum Beispiel 10.000 oder 20.000 oder 100.000 Unterschriften, dann denke ich mir, konnte man etwas äh, in Bewegung setzen. Das ist meine Meinung. Aber ich, ich wollte nur Grace fragen, ob das möglich ist. Ja, wir können so schön diskutieren, aber etwas zu tun müssen wir. Denn, äh ja, ja, es gibt ja auch noch viele Netzwerke, Antima, und Akteure die, und Akteurinnen, die zu und in Afrika oder in Uganda oder DRC Kongo oder in Myanmar oder in den Philippinen arbeiten. Ähm, ich ich mache jetzt den Vorschlag, dass wir hier noch mal eine Runde machen. Theo, ähm, 
Rita hat auch noch ein paar Fragen gestellt, die auch noch mal daran erinnern, wie kann man, oder noch mal fragen, wie kann man eigentlich an junge Männer, äh, mit jungen Männern arbeiten, in der Reintegration, in der Aufarbeitung von sexueller, Gewa sexualisierter Gewalt. Please go ahead and just try to give your final statement and pick up questions uh, if you want. Yeah, it's, you can write 20 PhDs about that question. So it's, there are no, I don't think there are any simple answers to it. Um, let me just give an example of one of the projects that I once witnessed when I was in Kenya, which I think was a great way to work with um, with men and masculinity issues. Um, and the program was called A Real Man Is. And it was a radio program and it was hosted by very famous people, a very popular man in Kenya. And it had a lot of slogans. A real man never hits a woman. A real man loves his children. A real man will provide for his family. Um, and I think what this campaign did uh, was to engage with young men in a very positive way. It was not what I've seen in the Congo. I've seen um, feminist organization coming in and they are getting all the women from a village and they train the women in their rights. Well, great thing to do that, but the moment those women come home, their men will beat the living hell out of them um, because the men were never included and it's a very negative kind of campaign against men. Uh, so if you want to reach out to men, engage them in a positive way and understand their issues. I always get a bit upset when I hear the, the, the phrase women and children are the worst affected victims in the conflict. Based on what analysis, based on what statistics, based on what research, uh, I would never ever want to quantify suffering or quantify what somebody feels. I think everybody's a victim in their own right and everybody has their own issues and they and these issues need to be understood and they need to be taken serious. So if you want to work with men then listen to them, understand what are the issues that they are dealing with and engage them in a positive way. Um, and don't just engage men, engage whenever you engage men or whenever you engage women, try to engage them together. Um, I think in, in Africa, the family structure, everywhere in the world, but I think most notably in, in some of the places where I work, the family structure is, is very, very important. Work with those family structures when you are trying to address issues surrounding sexuality, surrounding rape, sur surrounding sexual violence, surrounding violence in general. Um, so engage people positively and engage them within the family setting. Um, and I think the A Real Man Is campaign, the radio campaign that I heard in Kenya, is a great example of how you can bring social change through uh, a positive, positive intervention. Probably you get further questions to the role of the EU or recommendations, and this is why I just would like her to Thank you. talk. Um, it's really hard to go say anything um, substantial after what Grace said in terms of um, her five points, advanced education, sustainable projects, stop the arms trade, um, money is being spent on the wrong things. These are, these are just the points I wrote down, which is something, things that I can only emphasize as well. Um, ju I just have two, two last points, and that's um, what Suzanne was talking before about the comprehensive approach and how everything is sort of, is not sort of, everything is very much connected. So security sector reform, reintegration processes, um, the stopping of the arms trade, um, development work, everything is so connected in certain areas and a lot of these projects go in to focus on one very specific thing and I understand that's pragmatic and that's the that's what needs to be done in certain ways, there, there are limitations, but at the same time, we really need to have a much more um, a comprehensive understanding of conflicts and how they work and specifically about child soldiers, just as food for thought, um, child soldiers worldwide always come, a great majority of them come from the poorest and the most disadvantaged sectors of society, regardless of what continent they're fighting on um, and what they're fighting for. So we just can think about that in terms of, of how we can actually combat this, this phenomenon.
Um, and the second point is just um, simply about the role of, of non-state actors in this. I think there's um, a lot of good that the UN and that the EU can do, but I think we need to be realistic about the limitations that they have. They are inherently political organizations. They are made up of nation states. They are limited, and as, as you said before, there are groups that they really cannot and will not interact with. And that is where the non-state actors, NGOs, can come in and actually do this work. Um, just my organization specifically works with a lot of so-called resistance and liberation movements. These are movements that we would call, or the media would call rebel groups. They don't prefer that name. They call themselves resistance and liberation movements. These are movements like the SPLA in South Sudan, which is now the government. Um, and um, we are um, <coughs> asked every once in a while to come into various embassies in Berlin and explain our relationships with these, with these groups because the, the states are not always pleased that we're doing this. Um, but I think that the point here is that there needs to be much better co coordination between the UN, the EU, and these NGOs that are doing this work. And I think that if they were better coordinated, they could figure out um, who is doing what and who's best placed to do what, whether it's Amnesty International fighting for the arms trade treaty or whether it's an organization that can deal with going in and trying to extract child soldiers in a certain element in a certain conflict. There are certain things that each of these groups does best and that needs to be better coordinated. Thank you very much, and um, maybe I will start um, by reacting to the <laughs> last speaker. Well, um, yes, um, yeah, I, I, I believe, yes, there is a certain need for a sort of a division of labor between the state and non-state uh, organizations, and um, and uh, definitely there is a space for, for better coordination so that we can be more efficient. But I would like to also stress the question of accountability and implementation of commitments. Because, um, well, you mentioned, for example, Geneva Call, and we are working with them, we are funding them in Africa and um, elsewhere. But these are 18 people um, uh, in total. So um, it's very nice to have a unilateral um, uh, commitments, but we, make, we have to make sure that those are also implemented and that we don't give certain credibility to a non-state actor just because he made uh, you know, unilateral commitment and we don't know about, you know, we can't monitor properly what they are doing. So I think that we should be also very um, yeah, careful about um, you know, what we are trying to achieve. Uh, but definitely more coordination and a division of labor is uh, very useful. I um, took with me uh, really a need to think more about the sustainability of um, our activities, and I think that this is one of the uh, weak points which we realized also in, in our policy. Um, and also question of uh, conditionalities is something which we are discussing now whether or not and how we could actually introduce some sort of a conditionality in our assistance. So that, for example, if the state um, take a commitment to implement the action plan and after five years, you know, it's still nowhere, what can we do? What can we, should we stop? But then, of course, there are also difficult questions. Stop, should we stop? the assistance to security sector, well, because it brings also some other benefits. So it's, it, it, there are a couple of very difficult questions which we need to put um, ourselves. Um, on corruption, and indeed we have our own organization which is reviewing the implementation of our projects, OLAF. And uh, yes, we realize that um, quite important you know, parts of our assistance are somehow not getting to the to those who are in need, but I think that um, in the human rights area we're trying to overcome this problem through different means. And uh, for example, um, our instrument for human rights um, is most of like 90% of our assistance goes directly to the civil society organizations or to UNICEF. And I think that this is one of the way how we can overcome this problem. Um, and so maybe I will stop there. Ready? So, I think it's up to Grace to say whatever you like, final words. You came already up with your recommendations. I would like to ask you, what are you going to do next after? Do you leave to Uganda? Okay. Oh, thank you. That is a very important question that uh, <laughs> I was going to feel so bad if I leave uh, Germany without sharing um, my most precious 
and uh, my towel that has wiped all my tears for this long period I've been working with returnees. I, w I, I, I really want to appreciate um, especially Germany. I am what I am, even if I'm getting exposed around the world for whatever good I'm doing, it's because of the the exposure that I received from Germany, and then the trust they put in me, and then my effort to see that whatever trust they have put in me, I shouldn't let them down. And uh, in relations to her question, in 2007, when my contract ended with Caritas, I developed, because when I was working in Caritas, and it's, it's, it's a coordinated story that, let me cut it short, but it's, it helps me a lot and you to understand. Uh, before leaving Caritas, you know, I was this, in this reception center that you have just watched, and I happened to be kept in hostage by the rebel when they attacked the reception center. And uh, over 200 returnees were taken while I'm seeing them like this. And some of them didn't come back. Some were cut into pieces. Some who saw how they were being tortured and killed came and reported to me. And most of them were my own client. And one of the, the boy that uh, he, he, he was my uh, child that I used to counsel. He asked me, uh, teacher, let me open the door for this rebel. If we don't open, they're going to kill us all. Then I told him, please don't open. Let me open. Go and hide yourself. So he went and hid himself plus other children. And I decided to open the door for the rebels to enter. Then... I ran away, they opened, came, collected these children and went. After this scenario, I almost ran mad. I requested to be transferred in Kitkum and I went to the community and started working with uh, the children, the returnees that I reunited in the community. And there we were having a kind of, we, we sit every week and have a discussion how about their coping, the challenges they're facing in the community. Uh, but after my contract ended with Caritas, I told myself that now that my contract has ended with Caritas, should I stop visiting these children? So one thing that I did, I said, it's not possible. Let me initiate an organization, even if uh, we can just sit and, uh, you know, have discussion, we get uh, a local organization or international organization within the country that can help, that would be good. And then when I came to Germany, I met uh, Medica Mondiale. They, got, uh, they gave me their forms that uh, we have seen what you're doing with uh, war victim. So this is our form. If you like, to, has to give you some money. How we, we support very little. We support uh, organization with some little money. If it's okay for you as caritas, please fill this form. So, even uh, gearing towards the form that they were they gave me, I went to the district and said, uh, I need to open an organization, and I got uh, someone who advised me. I wrote the constitution with some group. Plus, the women that I sit with every week to discuss uh, their trauma issue and uh, problem and all that. So we opened the organization, and even up to now, it's still in their names. The founders of the organization are returnees themselves, returning mothers and, uh, and, and some of the communities, uh, resource persons. So I founded that organization and it's, it has become a very powerful organization. One thing that I, I don't want to, to, to put so much is, it's, it's, it's not has to show what we are doing, 
but it's the community to the beneficiaries and the community to know, to realize that this organization is doing this. So all that feed, the feedback we are getting from the community is, is, is not our initiative. It's, whatever, it's what has impacted them that they are trying to share. And my studies in Australia is going to help me to go back and strengthen the organization. Uh, last year, we received uh, one organization for, called Uganda Fund, plus Medica Mondiala, who that started their support from 2007. Immediately, I opened the organization and shared with them. They agreed to support the organization. And uh, next year, 2014, they are going to fund for work for three years. They used to just give six months, one year contract. But after doing an evaluation, seeing the impact, they really appreciated. They couldn't believe that the little money they are giving has impacted that much. That's why I strongly believe that if we could uh, have a mega resources that we distribute to poor country to help situation like this, if we can channel it straight, however little it is, if we can channel it straight to people who are trusted, I think we can change the situation of, of, of the people down there. And um, what is it for work? It's called Foundation for Women Affected by Conflicts, and that is the organization that I'm going back to strengthen. And uh, I forgot to, to tell you it's... Uh, accepted nationally. It, this year it has been registered as a national organization that supports uh, its uh, community it development as a whole. It's not, no longer only for returnees. Thank you so much. Thank you, Germany. Thank you, Medica Mondiale, and all taxpayers' money. And then singing about the war in northern Uganda, and now that we are here to celebrate not no more tears, and as I said, never again. With this example, we should take it forward and help other world. And those other issues that I share, I feel that it is just a pain that makes me sometimes talk about certain things. But then, when we see the world today, uh, there are people who are more we are not equal. There are people who are more powerful than others. But if the world one day can wake up to say, no, we should think that everyone in this world is equal. We may be different in color, but we should be equal. Then the world problem can be solved. But if we can still see that there are others who should be high and others should be low, and then we fight our economic war in the expense of the vulnerable people, then still we will not go anywhere. Thank you so much. Ich danke allen auf dem Panel. Es war, ich finde, ein sehr angenehmer, kompetenter, engagierter Panel. Ich danke Ihnen, aber ganz besonders Grace. I wish you all the best. High appreciation and high admiration for your work you did so far with all the people, with the children in your country. I wish your country, North Uganda, good luck. Thank you so much for being with us and we will hopefully stay in contact. Good night. <laughs>